I'm clinical microbiologist, and I was asked today to just go through some fungal pathogens, um, some classification, and then just um, brief special focus on PJI fungal pathogens, as well as um, we'll just briefly touch on diagnostics. So with regards to the classification of medically important fungi, they are named according to the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi and Plants. And they can be classified in various manners. Um, there's also a formal taxonomic classification, which we don't use in the laboratory. Um, rather, we use this informal laboratory classification, um, which is much easier and um, more you know, easy to apply. So we divide this, um, this group into yeasts or unicellular fungi to thermally dimorphic fungi and then molds and fil filamentous fungi, which are thermally monomorphic. So I'll just briefly um, put this diagram up, which um, just nicely depicts this um, informal classification. Looking at yeasts there, I think we all really are familiar with candida and candida species. And then non-candida yeasts, um, which I think cryptococcus is the most commonly um, you know, recovered in our setting, and those are the others in blue. The thermally dimorphic molds, that endemic and non-endemic um, division is for the United States. I will later in this presentation just show what's endemic in South Africa. And then the thermally monomorphic molds, which I'll also discuss in more depth, but it's the zygomycetes or the mucoraceous molds, the dermatiaceous or the pigmented molds, the dermatophytes, um, which infect the skin, hair, and nails, and then your hyaline molds, Aspergillus, Fusarium, Acrimonium, Scopularopsis, and Penicillium, which are medically important for us. So looking at the unicellular fungi, and they're oval round cells, they're much larger microscopically to bacteria. They bud to form daughter cells. Sometimes those buds remain attached to the mother cell. They elongate and they form these highly like structures which are visible there in the image. And in culture, they form bacteria-like colonies. Most of our bloodstream infections um, and, and also orthopedic infections are due to candida species, which we'll see later. Um, and then just um, with regards to cryptococcus, which is the second most commonly recovered, that's um, separated by various methods, but the presence of pseudohyphae and the oval shape of candida as opposed to cryptococcus, which is much larger and round, and often there's a visible capsule and it doesn't form pseudohyphae. Then just to focus on candida species, I'll just put this in just as a helpful overview. So the prototypical um, candida species are in the first column, or in the first row, candida albicans, tropicalis, diplinientis, and gilamaranii. These are usually susceptible to fluconazole as well as a kind of candens. And um, many of the statements are, that are made on candida species are made in direct comparison to candida albicans. Candida glabrata has recently undergone taxonomic review and is currently known as the Cassiomyces glabrata. And this is due to its resistance to fluconazole. Um, and one must just be aware that many of these isolates are resistant. Most of them remain susceptible to echinocandins, but resistance has been reported and appears to be on the rise. Candida parapsilosis. Um, increasing, showing increasing resistance to fluconazole. This is a very strong biofilm former, much like um, former, much like candida albicans. It's associated with central lines and implantable devices. It also has a lower content of beta D-glucan. So the sensitivity of beta D-glucan um, is affected in that specific species. Um, it's the lowest with candida parapsilosis. With Canada crucia, which has also recently undergone taxonomic review, um, it's now known as Pichia Kudrev's Sevii, and that is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole, susceptible usually to the echinocandins, also may have decreased susceptibility to amphotericin B and fluocytosine, and um, most commonly found in patients with hematologic malignancy, likely due to the azole prophylaxis. 
Canada, Lusitania, many of those are resistant to amphotericin B, um, often remain susceptible to fluconazole and echinocandins. And then, of course, Canada porous, which we are aware um, is an emerging, emerging global pathogen, highly resistant to fluconazole. Ma and many of those isolates um, also show resistance to amphotericin B and echinocandins based on our tentative breakpoints. Um, and then, like um, previously mentioned, there's identification issues with Canada porous um, laboratory identification issues. Um, which we are aware of. These are predict predictable identification issues. Then just looking um, with regards to the virulence, um, I've put Canada albicans there because that is the focus with regards to PJIs, um, capable of infecting human hosts. They display a, a huge host of um, virulence factors. Um, and Canada albicans is considered the largest and most important biofilm producer it is, um, can adapt efficiently to changing environments, expressing adhesions capable of binding to a variety of native and implanted materials, in addition to all of its other virulence factors. Then we go to the thermally dimorphic molds. These are molds that can exist um, in two forms, um, depending on temperatures, so environmental temperatures, and um, they exist in the mold form, and that's 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, and they are yeast forms at body temperatures. There are seven genera of thermally dimorphic molds, and four of them are endemic in South Africa. Sporothrix, Blastomyces, Emergomyces, and Histoplasma are endemic. Coccidioides, Paracoccidioides, and Telleromyces, Marnepii are not endemic. Thermally monomorphic molds, I've discussed the zygomycetes or mucoraceous molds. These are agents of mucomycosis. Um, these, this is often um, causes different syndromes in immunocompromised patients and those with diabetes. And then dermatiaceous molds, which are common in swell and are commonly associated with traumatic inoculation. Um, some of them are agents of Majera foot. Um, and then dermatophytes, and those are fungi which with the ability to gain their nutrients from keratin and they infect in skin, hair, or nails. Highland molds, and the most common there are Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Penicillium. So now just looking at, um, just briefly going over fungal diagnostic methods. The um, gold standard is histopathology. It's a direct microscopic examination um, where we utilize an enzymatic digestion um, and with KOH, and then we visualize um, any um, hyphae or other fungal elements. And then there's also fluorescent antibody staining. Um, and then, of course, as mentioned, histopathology. And then we get fungal culture. And of course, as mentioned by Ruan, there's a couple of issues with, with culture. Its sensitivity is not great. Um, the turnaround time is poor. And I'll discuss just now how we, as microbiologists and laboratory diagnostic specialists, try and enhance pathogen recovery. And then non-culture methods, those are serology, antibody detection, antigen detection, and immunohistochemistry, um, and then finally molecular methods, as outlined by Ruan, and PCR and microarrays. I've just put this in just to outline that uh, we often think of culture as the gold standard, but microscopy of direct histology and cytology is considered gold standard um, in fungal diagnostics. Then just discussing PJI diagnostics. So the incidence is about one to 4% of primary lower limb arthroplasties and more than 30% of revision arthroplasties. And the true incidence rates have been shown to be skewed due to diagnostic issues. So what are the diagnostic challenges? As mentioned, there's no gold standard diagnostic tests. And that is a clear challenge with, with regards to diagnosis. Um, PJI has lacked um, standardized diagnostic criteria or diagnostic algorithms. The definitions between MSIS and ETSA, et cetera, um, were heterogeneous. And the common question often remains with orthopedic surgeon, is there an infection or not? And that obviously poses difficult clinical decisions. Like we said with culture, there's prolonged turnaround time, imperfect culture-based diagnostics, and culture-negative cases um, come at a cost with um, which is up to 40% and 
um, is associated with um, broad spectrum antibiotics like Ruan Outline, Mero and Bank, um, and that's obviously got its issues. So why is specific pathogen identification critical in PGI? It not only informs antimicrobial management, that's with the selection of primary systemic antibiotics, the need for adjunctive drift with staphylococcal infections, the selection of local cement and spaces, as well as the decision on duration of therapy. It also informs operative planning, like with Staphylococcus aureus and polymicrobial infection, which can predict um, their failure. And then, of course, attempts that there for fungal pathogens have substantially low cure rates and are not um, often practiced. So, like I was saying, as laboratory diagnostic specialists and microbiologists, it, it has become um, sort of our mandate to try and improve um, the pathogen recovery and reduce culture negative rates. And there's a couple of ways in which we can do this. Um, so firstly, it starts with you guys with regards to acquisition in the pre-analytical phase where you are acquiring these specimens. So we know that we want multiple independent specimens, um, generally five to six specimens. We want large volumes of pus, of fluid. Um, we advise against swabs. And then um, also blood culture bottle inoculation um, of those fluids, improve sensitivity of culture. And then in the laboratory, with regards to um, implanted devices that we receive, sonication is known to improve sensitivity, as well as with regards to tissues, um, pre-processing or like mastication, cell lysis, dissociation, and then also with regards to fluids, centrifugation and blood culture bottle inoculation. I've just put this table in and it was a small review on the differences between native septic arthritis and prosthetic joint infection. Just underlined there that blood cultures um, are more often positive in native septic arthritis. And I'm sure anecdotally you've seen that 50 to 7 percent positive in non gonococcal um, septic arthritis and with PJI, unfortunately, mostly negative. This is the MSIS 2018 criteria. Um, because of no gold standard, there's obviously a criteria that we follow. And I've just highlighted there that two periprosthetic culture, cultures with identical organisms is considered a major criteria and diagnostic here of PJI. And of course, we encourage you to take multiple independent specimens. So now I'm just going to quickly um, present some of our data. So this is unpublished data on fungal PJIs, and this is the time period between 2018 and 2023. We searched using those locations or sites, D10 theater, D14, D15, D5, F22, and F23. The specimens we looked for were as aspirate, swab, sterile fluid, tissue, and bone. So for PJI, there were a total of three in this period. Um, two candida albicans with uh, susceptible, of course, to fluconazole and for B mycofungin and caspofungin, and then a candida perapsilosis, which was fluconazole and non susceptible. Just of note, um, the, the two candida albicanses were from broth, and then that perapsilosis was from a shoulder. This, um, so as mentioned earlier by Prof, that there's a growing, there's a growing number of, of cases of PJI with fungal pathogens um, in the last decade. And this is the database search of a PubMed and Scopus with the search um, of the, those terms, fungal um, infection, candida, arthroplasty, and, and all, all the rest between 2009 and 2019. And this was what they reported. So for four fungal um, pathogens um, associated with PJI, and at, right at the top, 48.6% um, is candida albicans, candida parapsilosis. So much like what we saw, although we have a very small sample size, only three, also it's reflective. Um, and then the um, non-albicans candidas, and then the non-candidal pathogens was two, six aspergillus and six pichia, um, so 2.3% for no, rather 4.6% of non-candidal pathogens. So I thought I would also just report on fracture-related infections and osteomyelitis. And this is the data, same um, search criteria, candida albicans, um, candida paracelosis, candida glabrata were recovered, reflecting the international data, and osteomyelitis, one candida albicans. 
Looking at fungal, uh, we found fingers and hands. Also, Canada albicans and parapsinosis, we had one sporothric schenchia for a finger, and then also Canada albicans with a hand species. So all in all, we had 11 fungal isolates recovered um, during that period, seven candida albicans, four candida parapsilosis, and one candida glabrata. So in discussion, fungal PJI GSH appears to be rare, three cases over a five-year period. Candida albicans predominates, mirroring global data on fungal PJIs. All yeast isolates at GSH were susceptible to amphotericin B, and no molds were implicated. In conclusion, PJI is one of the most feared complications of total joint arthroplasty and has obvious diagnostic challenges. Fungal PJI is rare, and although PJI is commonly a result of colonization by staphylococcal species, fungal pathogen cases have been reported. Candida species are the most common fungal pathogen identified with candida albicans implicated in most cases, and fungal PJI has therapeutic implications and case management is typically complicated by patient comorbidities. Those are my references. Thank you. Any questions for Rosemary? I mean, well, I, think I want to ask one thing. I mean, with um, biogenic uh, results, we often describe a single result as a possible contaminant, specifically when the pathogen could be on the skin. So, can a fungal ever be a contaminant out of it? Or a bat or a skin? Yeah, I think it can because they do colonize skin. So, yeah, so it depends on the manner in which you've taken that specimen. And then, of course, looking at other criteria, I mean, I mean if there is a PJI, you'd have to look at our chemistry and yeah. you know, the water markers that they guide you. Uh, might more of a comment and maybe a kind of discussion. So we, we, we've seen a couple, and I'm not sure if you've got us something, but one a shoulder, one an elbow. Yeah. So the one folks are going to do it. You're going to do it. From you. Thank you. You can go somewhere else, but don't worry. It's just okay. I'll take it. Thank you. So, and I think something from private and uh, yeah. So we now have one three elbows, three total elbows. This is really big series. If you look at the literature, this is a case of what? And we, we've got the second shoulder now was, was here last year. We, he, he is allergic to uh, the normal drug that we use, so he's been on that other drug. Yeah. Um, the, so one thing in an amputation, one had no treatment and subsequently had four operations with four biopsies with no candida grown. We grew candida from six samples first time round. So it was clearly equivocal that it was a, a candida. So completely cleared by itself on six different samples. So bizarre. Untreated. 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 We really either soon that we stuck with it and from was that to treat a candida infection, you had to have an excision two-stage operation. So she was untreated, but we should have, she already had yeah. rheumatoid on the right? She had on the She's a 50 year old, healthy year old woman. So she'd been presented at our meeting. So, and then uh, the other one is busy on treatment now, I'm sending it to the this one. And the other person is now probably about two, three years down the line, is, is cured on three months of antifungals. So we, we don't know where we are. And if we look at the literature, it's very confusing for me now. Is, do we do six months, do we do three months, which drug do you use? And what's even worse for me is that if you put it in cement, does it not kill the antibiotic? Is it the cement that's the heat of the cement that's killing the bugs? Is it the antibiotic? How long does it stay? I know there's very little, little literature. <laughs> and and then there is this, yeah. there's no more fungal effect on them. So I'm not sure if we have any comments on those sort of thoughts. I'm hoping Priya will answer some of those questions with regard to therapeutics. Um, okay. But... So, then, then, I'm not saying, can, can it be a contaminant? So, we've got six samples that are positive and get untreated. I mean, she did biopsy four different times. I'm open, properly taking biopsies and negative. 
So I've got, um, we will see where you can answer. So on the tea nose, also on the call, there is something that is a little bit more common in primates. I think there's a lot more patients with multiple revisions, antibiotic exposure. So we have a much larger cohort of primate Yeah, I mean, there, many, there will be many factors driving that, right? So one is, is the context makes sense that six articles are positive and you've got this one species of Canada, and it may be a true reflection. But I think often sometimes, and we've seen this not with your unit, but with uh, urology, is that the equipment that we used can introduce contamination. And, and, and that can sometimes fast things a bit as well. So, you know, how, especially in places where we are forced to reuse equipment that we probably shouldn't be, be doing because we're trying to cut, cut costs. So I think sometimes they, that dynamic, and it's very difficult to know if that was just a you know contamination yeah. issue, not within the patient, but instrumentation. And that uh, speaks to you know how we want to play them and all that. So that's that's probably not so, so, so the one that's here, I can tell you now is done the proper way with the open individual each one is cleaned and new new samples and it's not a reused equipment, not a scope. So uh, so that's so for that one. Yeah, so I mean, that's I was just going to ask whether you had a sense of uh, whether you, you are experiencing more fungal infection. Because one of the things about fungal infection is actually the laboratory is very difficult to, to grow these things. And, and often, you know, in the patients where you're suspecting a serious infection but nothing is grown, we often think about bacteria. But there's probably a cohort where it's actual fungal infection. And sometimes it's on the third something that you actually find find in the fungal infection. I think it's still rare, but it's definitely an increase. I mean, just at the moment, we have a spondylitis, fungal spondylitis, kind of I've recently had a fungal FRI, which is very rare. You know, we have all this. Well, when you see product, you managed as well. Yeah, yeah that's so right. it's definitely, and I think what is definitely, definitely on the increase. So you, sorry, yeah, Tina, is that a for longer that we might be picking them up? Is it a longer period that the fungus grows? Do you need the fungal? What's the difference? Is it a growth? I mean, it's a different process. So we, if we don't ask for it, it doesn't get No, no. So most of these that we are, are, are cultural and conventional methods, not really? specifically. Yeah. All of them. So Tina, yeah. Tina has a hand up. Tina, are you um, online? Maybe you can just. Yes. I can ask Hi. Hi, I'm a rep and everybody. Hi. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, um, we can. Yeah. I just, um, I always uh, make the point, um, you know, if, um, if, uh, something doesn't make sense in terms of, uh, you know, trying to make the cultures fit with the patient. Um, I always go back to, you know, if, if there's six, obviously, you know, six candida albicans on six different samples in the patient is concerning. But I have, uh, you know, um, uh, anecdotally gone into a couple of the, you know, going into and speaking to the to the surgeon. And in some cases, I found that the surgeon hasn't used a separate forceps or separate tools to uh, to take the culture. So in some cases, you might have a contaminant on that, and then you obviously contaminate the six different samples with that same tool. And then we find, you know, it might not actually be a true fungal infection, that it might have been on the first one, and then you've contaminated the other six. So in that case, there might not necessarily have been a fungal PJI in that situation. For instance, if somebody may have had a uh, a growing thrush, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So one does need to actually put it into context and see whether that was a true infection. If you know all the other markers were normal, so it's just something to think about. Because um, I have had cases, you know, where we've grown a pathogenic organism at, and everything else is actually um, normal, and it turns out to be just a loosening. And patients do get better without any um, antimicrobials at all. So it's just something to think about. You know, and maybe can you just comment on on the um, the cases from uh, the unit versus Bologna? It's also from my memory, mostly Brachycephalosis and some other scapula Canida auris, um, the, the pathogens that you see. Yes, I think um, the ones that we see mostly, as you mentioned, yes, um, we haven't seen many Canada albicans. I think the ones that are particularly uh, biofilm producing in our case, and we know that's colonized the skin and love, um, you know, prosthetic material are the parapsilosis uh, species, and those are the ones that we've seen the most. Uh, we've had quite a lot of PJIs, and I, I'm sure Tom will present that later. 
Um, yeah, and usually we do grow them um, after about five to seven days. Um, and it's usually on three or more samples that we found. Uh, generally fit, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the patient profile. Um, normally it's a patient who's been on um, antimicrobials previously. Uh, it's not usually their first rodeo. Um, they have had previous operations before. Uh, it's normally on a revision. Um, it's normally patients who have yeah, been on antibiotics. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, Tom will go through the rest of it. But, yeah, normally candida auris, normally candida parapsilosis. And um, some of them do well. Some of them don't do so well. Um, and, yeah, but we'll go through all of that with Tom. So, yeah. Any other questions for Rosemary? Yeah, good question. I saw one of your slides that it said that direct tissue invasion on microscopy it is diagnostic for a PJI. Would that be a way of distinguishing between like a contaminant and the actual infection? I see. Yeah, that's why I was I actually might be nice. This microscopy is still purely manual. It's like someone looking at a slide, which is there. So well, when it comes to histopathology, yes, and um, so there's digestion in that's in the microscope. There's no AI or ETLA mm -hmm. uh, as your expert for us. Yeah. 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 Well, there is total lab automation and machine learning for microscopy, but that's more for cell counts, and that's just to improve standardization so that you don't have different cell counts per individual. Mm -hmm. And, and should we be asking for a fungal culture on every PJI now? Or do, does it routinely get cultured here yeah, through the yeah. So I think, I think you, you can ask for it. It does grow on our routine media. Um, but when it comes to um, molds, et cetera, the, I mean, our Samarodes, Dextros, Agon may assist with recovery and the solution. But you're not going to be involved with PJI. No, yeah, no, no. Just going to read if I'm going all the all the PJs are yeasts. So yes, yes. So they are the normal yeast. Yes. Yeah. That will that will be recovered on our on our routine media. Thank you, Manish. But perhaps I think we, if, if there's a high suspicion in a particular case, then mm -hmm. know, it's worth alerting the the micro lab that is being. What they do, we talked about the, the other genomics is that the sixteen S. DNA is not all. You have to actually ask for a bundle of DNA on the 16S. 18 Yeah, you actually have to ask for a bundle of DNA. Yes, one, yes that's the new, But the new study now, it routinely picks up fungi and bacteria. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to reduce culture negativity. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, James. Thank Sorry, do we have a sonication facility? Or? I don't think we sonicate. No. no. Would be found in the back room. No, Stephen, he was using a bone crusher, he was using another instrument to crush the tissue, which is obviously a slightly different process. That there's some um there's, there's some similarities in the increased yield. Um so he did a study on crushing the song, it's not certification, but and I mean might we might acquire a certificator. Yeah. Is that the right word? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah so I mean, I, I, I chatted to Tina um, about, you know, what, what, do, what do they do at their site? And um, they don't sonicate, they, they are vortex in, in broth, mm -hmm. um, which uh, some literature or, or from Tina mentioned that, you know, you get the same sensitivity gain with less specificity loss. So, you know, as a, as a protocol development is ongoing, so if Anyone feel strongly that we should include sonication as a participate in study and either we can or not include it. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. We know, so that begs a question do we know what our negative alpha relate for PJM? Yes, we know. So we actually, our mm -hmm. negative rate is quite low. So, so it's PJS is around 10 to 15 percent, so much lower than um, other literature. So it's not a big problem for us. Probably the reason because. We mostly investigate for heart side. And there might be some patients with mildly painful joints. That they're not having any culture. So we mostly investigate for heart signs, and then our, our culture negative 
that's really nice. So I'll continue the question. It's different studies you've done between the 10th and 15th century. Right now. But I'd like and, and um, Mark, do you, if you have a loose joint, do you send cultures away every single time? Or I don't. No, no. I send away every loose joint and I yeah, have very few, but it's really, I think and we should, yeah. But every single revision operation I do now, I'm getting trial. Yeah, and I'm amazed at the amount of people that come back to positive cultures. If not Marit, every single, almost everyone come back to it, like even not to be involved in the in, 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 in fact, so in other words, a non union or a fixation for a, a revision for another reason other than infection, 50% also have infection. So, it's so a high number. Yeah, it's a revision surgery. I think we must be thinking about it. We have to appreciate yeah. about the, the fungal culture in the DJI. I think if you only second or third revision and the patients were exposed to antibiotics before, perhaps only first revision is not. For the 16S, no, for, for if you want to send uh, tissue yeah. away in say yeah. something in front of this culture. So, in fact, we've just discussed today within fungal culture. So, everyone is fungal culture. Well, those cultures are going to drop on them, they've got the fungus, but there's not. But if you want a specific glass for the you put it in say like, and I would do that on most of the I asked a few people in yeah. private, and they said, don't worry, it's kind of, so I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> if, we, if we ask, if say we want a fungal culture here now, do we have to take a different sample than the broth of it? No. no. No, because it will be recovered on our primary media. Yeah. The 18S, if you want that, then you need yeah, to. Yeah, so you, you need to ask for the, for the fungus, for the DNA. You need yeah. And it's just we nice to of course, the whole back with that. So we first see if we call it just like me, and then we just do that as a second line with the cost. Can you retrospectively ask to for a fungus? I'm wrong. If we send a 16S away for bacteria, can we then, if we don't grow, everything's negative, can we then ask for a fungal on that DNA? No. Well, I think it depends on what tissues we sent and how it was processed. Because, uh, there's a risk if it's gone through one process. If you then retrospectively ask, there, there may be just noise and contamination, and you don't know what that means. Biochemically and clinically, do they present the same way as biogenic effect? Not a very good question. No, okay. Thanks. It's crumbling along. Um, the yes, the last year, Kenya also raised the same levels. So, uh, the last step, show the patient. Two weeks put up at a gliding sun. You can just grow back from it. I don't know, four of the samples. No bacteria in the central fungus. And now, two weeks after revision, had a revision and we sent away. So, two weeks ago, we sent the 16 samples, the six samples away. No growth. Two weeks later, gliding sun came back, four of the samples came back. So, it got from the wall. Thank you, friend. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. I'm Priya, one of the infectious diseases fellows, and I'm going to be giving a brief overview of the management of fungal prosthetic joint infection. And to start off, we are going to be talking about a case that I think everyone knows pretty well. It's a gentleman seen last year at your uh, unit. It's a, a 51 year old gentleman with multiple comorbidities, hypertension, smoker, poorly controlled epileptic, and raised BMI. He initially had a shoulder replacement in 2011 after a um, left humerus fracture and was seen again in 2023 in George um, with shoulder pain and weakness, reduced range of motion. He was assessed here at um, um, Pesquia's orthopedic unit and booked in for theater on the 31st of October. The initial surgery showed no signs of infection. He had a um, joint revised. And then the samples at that time, six samples taken, no growth. But within two weeks, the 13th of November, he had to be rebooked and for surgery because he had a draining sinus. This time, the repeat samples that are taken showed a polymicrobial um, prosthetic joint infection, both fungal and bacterial. Three out of six cultures had this candida parapsivosis. we have got the sensitivity down there. And as Rosemary has mentioned already, they often tend to be resistant to fluconazole, which is our first line azole and also had um, both um, staph species as well as anaerobes on that same sample. Um, what happened in the ward is that he had 10 days of amphotericin B to um, 
with for the for the um, candida parapsilosis, but then ran into issues with toxicity and had renal failure. Was switched to Zalaprozol. He also received linezolid to cover the um, gram positives. His implant was retained, and he did actually quite well. Was transferred back to George with, um, with the idea to follow up on the variconazole levels and follow up at um, at the orthopedic heart patients, which he has done. He stopped the linezolid and is continuing on his variconazole at this point. Um, keep this case in mind. We're going to just talk about some of the issues that all of the uh, that are raised here. So as mentioned, fungal prosthetic joint infections are much rarer than bacterial. It's only one to two percent of all PJIs. The um, data on the left there is from the WITS team who looked at all their PJIs from 2015 to 2022. I'm um, sorry, 2020, and they only noted two fungal infections of both candidates in their sample. But it is an emerging problem noted worldwide with increased number of surgeries done between joint replacements. And as um, um, Rosemary has also alluded to, the, it, uh, the incidence of resistance in fungi are increasing. And so they can be very difficult to treat appropriately. And there is a high recurrence rate with about 30% of the hip staff and 18.3% in knees. There are also diagnostic difficulties because the clinical features can be non-specific, and there's your MSIS criteria from 2018. So you need two positive cultures, but as we've said, fungi can take much longer to grow. They can um, even by special media longer time, so they might be sent home before that culture actually grows, depending on what the fungus is. And um, sinus tract. This patient did have a sinus tract that um, I presented, but that's actually in literature not reported to be the norm. They can, it's thought to be a much more chronic PJI and those symptoms can be um, more detailed. The CRP and ESR are often noted to be low and medically raised, um, which once again for your minor criteria might be an issue. The last issue, of course, is concomitant bacterial infection, which is actually noted in 15 to 20% of PJIs, in some case series up to 30%. And the issue is that there's synergism between the bacteria and the candida species. And for example, in Staph aureus, there's decreased effectiveness of the antifungal therapy because of the Staph and the candida biofilm and increased candida um, adhesion capability. The candida in turn decreases the susceptibility to vancomycin into that biofilm. In terms of endococcus um, species, which don't normally form biofilm very easily, Canada allows them to form biofilm. And an anaerobic um, organism, such as this patient who had a um, Rubiani bacteria, that um, Canada allows to have uh, enhances that hypoxic environments, allowing them to thrive in uh, there, otherwise, where they couldn't live. So, who gets? Fungal infections, looking at some of the literature. This is one of the larger case series. Um, we're looking at 376 uh, patients that they amalgamated with 207, 207 knees and 161 hips and a smattering of upper limb um, infections. And what they noticed is that on top of the normal risk factors for having a fungal infection, which was usually related to immunosuppression, one specific for fungal PJIs are what you've noticed probably anecdotally as well. The diabetics, the prolonged use of antibiotics, previous joint infections. Here, immunosuppression is not HIV related because the case series were not based in um, areas where there's a high background HIV population, but cancer and other um, autoimmune conditions, obesity, as well as multiple revisions. However, in up to a third of cases, it seems like there are no previous um, risk factors that are identified. And once again, this case series also noted a high number of candida albicans followed by parapsilosis, and a very few, so nine out of all their cases had actual um, aspergillus, which is normal, which is grown. There are case reports, however, there are every type of yeast infections found in prosthetic joints, but obviously not to great numbers. Mm -hmm. So how would you treat the mixture of surgery, question of antibiotic silence phase that has been raised, as well as, medical, as well as medical therapy. So in terms of implant retention, um, it's generally thought not to be a, 
valid option, mostly because it's been associated with assisted infections, multiple revisions. But as you can see, the numbers reported are very, very low. It's only really a handful of cases in literature. Single stage has been looked at in various centers and have um, published their results, but usually a little bit discordant, um, only 30 cases, once again, small numbers. And here, the key seems to be selecting your patients appropriately. So older patients or people with multiple comorbidities who might not be appropriate for multiple um, stage um, surgeries. And if you are going to treat um, medically that this patient will, um, the, the organism, the fungal organism that has been um, identified needs to be well identified and have a good sensitivity profile that you know is actually going to respond to treatment. Two-stage revision is obviously considered to be um, the, uh, the, the, the recommendation of choice. There has been actually a little bit of variation in what the eradication rates are. So um, in a larger series, 85% um, but down to 65 once again, depending on what are the actual sensitivities of those fungi. In terms of cement spaces, we want to act locally for so that to prevent oral systemic um, antifungals and trying to decrease the exposure to them because we'll discuss some of those issues why um, just now, but there's limited evidence on type and dosage. Antho B was initially used as it was heat stable, but there's been reports that they might be um, not adequate in terms of compressive, uh, decreasing the compressive strength of the PJI. There has been a move to use voriconazole instead, but once again, there isn't enough important data on if it is actually um, an appropriate replacement. Medical management is unfortunately a little bit murky. So there is no consensus between different groups on what actually should be fully recommended. Part of that is because there are differences in local resistance patterns of fungi. And the other part is that the um, patients, the, the, the drugs themselves are have a multitude of issues. And so selecting the patient and the correct drug can actually be quite difficult. In terms of duration of therapy, the easiest group is actually those who are not for theater and they're not candidates because they will get long-term suppressive therapy for life. For everyone else, if you're going through a two-stage procedure, it's not being confirmed what the interval between implant removal and implant reimplantation time should be. And um, sorry, it's being cut off, but the duration of systemic antifungals is also there's quite a wide variation between what the Americans recommend and sometimes what their European um, colleagues recommend. So just to go through that, um, this is the INSA, so this is the updated INSA, so the American guidelines. Um, as you can see on this side, it's osteoarticular candida osteomyelitis. So they recommend six to 12 months of fluconazole. The op there is an option for having an echinocandin, so our one that we have available to us is mycophungin, for two weeks as an induction before swapping to oral for six to 12 months. Then for septic arthritis, more on the left, they recommend six weeks of fluconazole or once again, two weeks of an IV induction followed by oral therapy. They have highlighted the, the prosthetic joint, they recommend the device should be removed. And that's a strong recommendation. And then, um, so that is their sum total of their Canada um, recommendations. In terms of the European, this is the, just the update in 2019. This is what the, the articles looking at their guidelines for Canada species, for consumer susceptible and peri prosthetic joint infections. As you can see, they said once again, an echinocandin for two weeks, then fluconazole for at least a year. That's it. And if it's resistant, individualized, with possibly with boriconazole. This is the ECMID, so once again, European guidelines from 2012. This is the last full guidelines for this. And as you can see, once again, spondylitis, guided and osteomyelitis, six to 12 months. However, if you're giving Ampho B, an induction IV between two to six weeks, so there's a very wide range there. And then followed by fluconazole for five to 11 months, so about a year. However, for voriconazole, they somehow say six to 12 weeks. So that's once again, a huge difference between a year and six to 12 weeks. 
And then for prosthetic joint infection, they say prosthetic remove and in a footnote to be combined with antifungal treatment. So it's not very clear at all what are the actual recommendations. And part of that is because there's not really a lot of data because the number of cases are so slow. There are no randomized control trials saying what would be the best way forward. And there are several antimicrobial challenges with um, with fungal uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. So the first would be drug drug interactions. I've got a, a slide following to just explain that, especially for the azoles. Toxicity, we all know amphotericin B, nephrotoxic electrolyte issues, thrombophlebitis. But the azoles also have their own brand of toxicity. As a class, they are all hepatotoxic, and each of them individually have variations of other toxicities, including neurotoxicity, um, periodontitis, <laughs> as well as phototoxicity. And um, voriconazole specifically needs therapeutic drug monitoring um, because there's a wide interpersonal, um, the metabolism of voriconazole varies greatly between individuals. And so um, you have to measure the levels check that they are therapeutic, if they're subtherapeutic, obviously the infection will continue to fester and the patient might develop resistance because they're having low level drugs. And obviously if they're too high, they will become toxic. And then you have um, to bring them back, change it, we don't have the boriconism monitoring in the state, the lab, it does get sent away to a private lab, increasing time, increasing um, all of those issues as well. So this is just from up to date about the drug drug interactions for azoles. I note there are over a thousand drug drug interactions for azoles, um, some of which increase. And um, so the reason being the azoles are potent and um, um, cytochrome people with the inhibitors. So they can increase the drug concentrations, especially of your anticoagulants um, um, and for chemotherapeutic drugs and lead to toxicity. They are in turn, um, their levels are reduced by cytochrome P450 inducers, like your rifampicin for TB drugs. If you remember in our first case, the gentleman was epileptic. So carbamazepine and phenytoin, two pretty commonly prescribed anti-epileptics, are actually inducers, so they can drop your levels. And, and other inhibitors can also increase the levels of um, your azoles. So just looking at toxicity, this is a gentleman that you will all recognize because he's still in the ward. He's 54 years, <laughs> IV drug user, HIV negative, presented from which was playing with progressive back pain and was found to have a paravertebral collection. With the biopsy showed a candidate crucia, also initially had on amphor B and was discharged on the baricamazole, but came back a month later complaining of visual hallucinations. And that is actually a very um, well-recognized side effect of voriconazole, and it's related to drug levels of more than 5.5 nanograms per liter, and his was 9.6. So once again, admitted, stop the drug, redo the levels, see how it goes. So it's a very, it's not without its own complications. So who gets um, risk factors for recurrence? And um, looking at this case review of 225 cases, they looked at knee joint arthroplasties and specifically the factors affecting um, recurrence were the Charleston comorbidity index of more than three. So those are your chronic um, comorbidities. They actually thought counting the albicans, raised CRP as presentation, and they found that the two stage was protective over a day. So in summary, we know that fungal infections are less common and Canada species are the most likely. They um, might not present with, with, with the um, signs of science and training, um, and it's harder to grow the bug and to identify it. There is unfortunately a little bit of um, variation in what the antibiotic recommendations are, but it's thought at this point still by expert opinion a two stage plus an azole, probably with a um, IV induction phase is best. But unfortunately, sex rates rates are, do not match that of bacterial PJIs at this point. Thank you.
I don't understand why. Why I mean, why they recommend an induction period with the mitral fungus? Is it just to have a different angle, or there's some synergistic effect with the result? Yes. It's no synergistic effect, but it does. It's much. It's thought to be because it's IV and because you're avoiding all the drug from interactions and everything, you're getting good levels and good sort of effective treatment quickly while you're waiting for your results to. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, for that. I just on your point, Brad. So there was a systematic review which looked at this is candidemia, though, for patients that um, were placed in amphotericin, azoles, or uh, placed in a kinocannon, and the group of patients on the kinocannons had a better treatment success. That's why we prefer for our sick patients to place them on the kinocannon um, initially. But in, in saying that, the kinocannons are very expensive, and I'm not sure if we, we, I guess it's good clinical practice to give the IV kinocannon for the first two weeks, and then, like we usually do, at least seven days of IV, and then change over to an oral option. We know they're significantly more expensive. I, I I I looked up the price the other day. Fourteen days of an echino candon is eight thousand four hundred rand. Fourteen days of pruconos is thirty one rand. So you know it's almost like a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to work out the revision rate is one hundred and fifty four hundred and fifty thousand, and then you still get any comparison. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your, your processes are quite expensive compared to our antibiotics. Our Rolls Royce antibiotic is 250,000, so uh, that's capital, but it's, you know, like it's fine. It's fine. But that's the point, though. I mean, the thing is, I don't know, is that state prices or price state? Yeah, it's not, it's not private. I mean, I've many patients, we start a patient with a ward and they default on when they go up because they have to go, the first time they go to the pharmacy, they get oh, 25,000 rand for their antifungal. Mm -hmm. So they stop taking it. Yeah. Uh, so that's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, boriconazole is very expensive. Our patient that's getting it now is costing the state 8,000 rand per month. Um, and he needs it for six months. Yeah. So it, it adds up. And, and just on the boriconazole that uh, Priya brought, brought up, and I, I think we sometimes forget this. Yes, there's intimate individual um, variability of the drugs, so hard works between each of us is not the same. But there's also got a narrow therapeutic index. So the level, is, the normal level is 1.1 to 5.5. And that's the problem with this guy. The minute you start seeing developing symptoms, you need to check the level, which is what happened. His was 9.6. And it wasn't a hectic dose he was getting, because I think he was only getting 200 BD, 200 milligrams. So, I recreational drugs, what's happening? Well, you see, this is the thing. I would have expected with recreational drugs, his, his enzymes are, are up there. So surely he would have had a low level. But he said he had a high level, right? So it doesn't make him, I don't know. Anyway, inter-individual variability. The other thing is with um, oriconazole that you, you need to consider is because it's got so many drug-to-drug -drug interactions, even if you add drugs later on, you need to make sure there's no drug-to-drug um, um, -drug interaction. So rifampicin, as Priya said, it's, it's, it's marked as an X. So we, we looked it up today with Yank. And the problem is rifampicin decreases Oriconazole by 93%. So it's, I mean, you basically give him a patient smart, it's right. Yeah. So it's just to keep in mind if you've got a patient who's got stack aureus as well as a candida albicans, you know, we should just be careful about adding that roof in. But uh, not can help, it's a Gibraltar. Two common comments. The first is that the vampires at the moment it sounds like it might not do anything for our body. The second thing is, is there any genuine evidence that we should be using the antifungals for three months, six months, or a year? Is there a scientific reasoning behind it, or just somebody thinks fungus takes a long time to treat this, put make it a year and see what happens? Yeah, so I, I was looking at Priya's slide now when she was showing, I think it was the European guidelines where they're saying grade evidence and standard, standard of standard of evidence, standard of Evidence versus quality of evidence, something like that. Standard was the, was the most of the time B, okay, which means moderate recommendation. Level of evidence was two or three. So two means based on um, prospective trials and three means expert opinion. What's expert opinion, right? And most of them were two or three. Yeah, I think just, just a comment. I think there's a caveat to this. I think one of the things about 
patients with fungal infections uh, in their joints or bones is that they often discover it late. And the recovery, once you start, is going to be long, I think. And, and I think the default has already just been, they're not better, so let's give and more and comments. I think that's how practice has really emerged. And it's probably time somebody really looks at that and, and sees it and, and, and see where, where we can go. Because I think now we're better diagnostically, we're probably catching them a bit earlier. And one could actually look at this and see uh, what's where, where is the true time to stop uh, uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the very first one we had was a, a patient from Lyson. In fact, they were nearly all from that part of the world. Eat some cat, maybe the DA would bring them down. <laughs> and, and so she, she ended up with an amputation. She was a rheumatoid and she was a revision of the revision. And she had some other joint issues. And, and we went to the literature and they said the rheumatoid has multiple joint pain, actually has candida in all the joints. So if you have a patient with, who needs a revision, you should be biopsying it the other joint because they have candida in them as well. And it, you cannot treat that patient. Basically, because they will constantly reinfect themselves and your, your antifungal will work. So I don't know if you came across that in the literature, but that was the first time I looked at the fungal infection in joint replacement. So if you, if you have a patient with multiple joints replacements, the rheumatoid, and they got candida in one, you must check the other joint. They say you must biopsy the other joint. It's crazy. Anyway, she's amputated. She's had a amputation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, how long have we been treating them for? How long have we been treating them for? Yeah. Uh, we'll at the moment, at the moment, we're doing six months. Eight thousand rand a month. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah it would be it would probably be double the price. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 I'm feeling supremely confident. <laughs> um, I first came across fungal PJIs uh, at, at, uh, in the private practice, and I'm lucky enough to have two great ID docs there, Kevin Reby and Helen van der Plus. And my introduction to, to uh, fungal PGI was from Helen, and she said that only fung fungi only grow on things that are dead. And um, unfortunately, she was very correct, and that patient ended up dying. And as you'll see a bit later in the, on in the talk, it was a candida aurus. And so these infections are very real. They're basically a PGI on steroids. And uh, the difficulty is more the cost that we've discussed because of the duration is much more. The morbidity to the patient is massive because of the duration of treatment, the length of hospital stay, and the outcomes are worse. And uh, in my opinion, uh, our NDT, both here and, and in private, is absolutely essential. It's taken away so much of my stress managing these conditions. And um, one of the great, uh, not comment um, now about the outpatient antifungals, one of the great aspects is that our ID guys apply to the medical funders and get authorization before the patient leaves the hospital so they don't have to pay for six months of antifungals out of their out of hospital benefits. And um, rightly or wrongly or good, goodly or badly, we, we've done so many times we get authorization quickly. Um, and there are many aspects um, to the MDT, as you well know, and, and we really find the team, including the nursing team and the management of CVPs, wounds, dressings, those kind of things is, is absolutely essential. And of course, the right setup in the theatre with the right infection control measures is very important. So are fungi taking over? And um, if you've watched The Last of Us, uh, it's a very good show. And uh, I can highly recommend it's all about fungi infecting our brains. <laughs> um, a lot of what I'm going to say now Peter said already, but uh, so the, if you've got a joint replacement in the li your lifetime, risk of developing a PGI is about 1 to 2%. One hips, two knees, 
that there's the chance of developing a fungal PGI is 1% of that. And so you're going to be very unlikely to develop a fungal PGI. And uh, to give you some uh, examples, in South Korea, over a four year period, they looked at 25,000 patients and only found 30 cases of fungal PGI. And the largest series in North America was uh, 41 patients they found in all their um, replacements over 10 years. And we discussed some of the risk risk factors, which actually aren't much different from that of a bacterial PGI. And it's very difficult to tell the difference. And I don't think any of us would be able to look at a patient clinically or, or radiologically and say that this is a fungus. Um, one has to be very cognizant, however, of a couple of things. And one of those things is uh, recent antibiotics, whether that's been recent antibiotics over a joint replacement or the GP giving antibiotics, I think. Now we see the synergies in there, and uh, it sometimes creates an environment where the fungus can flourish. Prolonged wound drainage is a big issue uh, for surgeons and, and Michael and Mark have got a, a SOP for what we do when we've got a consistently leaking wound, and that's very important because that can be an entry point for uh, fungus, and it sounds like Steve's had a case like that as well. Um, and they do overlap with bacterial infections. We discussed, uh, so the literature I, I had was that almost uh, a third will have a concomitant bacterial infection, and there's a slight predominance for women and knee replacements to develop these. Uh, Canada seems to be the main culprit with non-Canada species um, comprising a much smaller part of the um, burden, with albicans and um, parasitosis being the two main culprits. In our series, which I'll show later, um, funny enough, albicans has taken a slightly lesser role. Uh, it's, we, we get it mostly after a prior revision, which is why I think that if you've had a patient that's been multiply revised, had a long-term treatment with lots of antibiotics, I'll culture for a fungus um, routine. In that situation, perhaps not your first PJI. And uh, unlike osteomyelitis and septic arthritis, um, candida PJI doesn't really arise from a contiguous point or a candidate. And uh, as we know, they're biofilm forming agents. Uh, so in terms of our sampling, we've developed a bone and joint uh, form to help the surgeons remember what to take. Uh, you'll see there's a little mark, a man, so we can, a woman, we can mark uh, where exactly the problem is. That's to help the microbiologists. And then to remind us to take anywhere between four and six samples, depending on what you believe, saline and, and for a fungal and uh, joint fluid for um, MCNS, putting that in an EDTA tube for a cell count as well, and then of course histology. So of course, medical management and surgical treatment together are absolutely critical and there's no role for one or the other an issue of just suppressing the patient. And as we can see, the survivorship, sadly, of fungal PGIs is not as high, even with two-stage revisions, um, anywhere 38%, which is much, much lower than uh, survivorship for two-stage PGIs for the bacteria, which is upwards of 80%, uh, but it's slightly higher for knees. I'm not sure the reason for that. And um, the most important thing, I think, sur surgically is a proper debridement. This is not a proper debridement. Neither is that. I don't think you need three surgeons to do a knee scope, and that's certainly not a proper debridement, but this is, you really need to fill the entire kidney addition if you haven't got there, you need to keep on going. And the picture on the right is to show that if you've got any, if you do have a fungal PGI, bone's so bad, you need to replace it with a nice clean needle. So our approach um, is a two-stage in all cases. We don't uh, ever do dares uh, for a fungus or a single stage with delayed reimplantation at about three months. We, our total treatment time is a minimum of six months, but this varies, as you can see in the literature, there's no hard and fast rules. We try to give two weeks of uh, IV therapy and then switch to high dose oral fluconazole if the patient or well, the fungi is sensitive. We don't often get the two weeks. Sometimes we're a little bit less, sometimes we're a little bit more. And we try and use a dual agent with a high fungal load, actually. Local antifungals, I do believe in them, although the, we, we're still waiting for those good trials to come out, but we use calcium sulfate beads. There's also no uh, guidance on how much antifungal to put in the beads. Um, 
we did a review of the case series that are out there and none of them make any recommendations. We use 100 milligrams of amphotericin B per 25 cc, either of whatever product you want to use. And what I have noticed is that the setting time is longer with an antifungal, so you need to mix it at the beginning of your operation and put it near the autoclave so it can set. And uh, anecdotally, I've seen more wound use um, using beads of this nature. Um, my spaces, you can see on the right, are, are, can be quite big, although this is a coating, but sometimes we use five, six, uh, seven mixes of cement and we add 100 milligrams of amphotericin B to every 40 gram mix of, of bone cement. So our cohort, we uh, have collected 19 patients over four years, which looks slightly alarming, uh, which because I think that's higher than certainly some of the reports from uh, Asia and North America, but I'm reassuring myself that we are filtering out a lot of those patients, nine of which were PJIs, same amount for um, bone infections, and we had one native septic arthritis. And uh, the micros below, as you can see, there's a predominance of the paracelosis, with almost half being that. Uh, Albicans, which is meant to be the main, well, the, the main contributor, we only had one case. And to note, of our Candida auris, we had six patients, three of whom died, two had an amputation, and one has a, a two-stage revision, and is approximately 18 months out, still with his joint, and so far, infection-free. So if we select out the PJIs, um, sorry, there's nine PJIs, I don't know about this, eight there, but the, the paracelosis was four. The, the, the aureus of the um, uh, patients, one died, we got an even spread, one died, one amputation, and one survived uh, so far with a two-stage. The LB was one, and Mr. Tanner was one. And uh, we saw a slightly higher uh, concomitant bacterial infection with um, four of the nine patients having uh, a concomitant infection. So for my take-home messages, uh, I strongly believe in antibiotic stewardship and not giving uh, antibiotics for uh, the drop of the hat, and I find the NDT extremely important. Really be get on top of your leaky wounds. Uh, we've seen a predominance of Canada species. I think a two-stage surgical procedure is the way to go with a proper debridement. One, there's no room for uh, a gentle procedure. You have to be aggressive. Um, the treatment is longer, the doses are higher, and I believe in local antifungals. And just be aware, if you have a patient with candida auris, be very, very uh, afraid because there is a high mortality and mortality from it. Thanks. Thank you.